right, we're, I'll just wait, um, some of you are having coffee, so I'll just, uh, we're having a change to the agenda because um, third morning speaker has not arrived yet, so we're just having a swap around, and um, we have come with us now our third speaker, who's going to, who was supposed to speak in the afternoon, who we've now moved before lunchtime, is Dr. Emmeline Burdett. Now, Emmeline gained her PhD from University College London in 2011. She is an associate of the Centre for Culture and Disability Studies at Liverpool Hope University and a book reviewer of Age Disability, which is part of HNET, an online humanities resource run by Michigan State University. In addition, she sub-edits for Disability Arts Online and edited a number of chapters for Dr. Colin Cameron's book, Disability Studies, A Student's Guide. She contributed a chapter on eugenics to the same book and also has written a chapter for Dr. David Block's forthcoming book, Changing Social Attitudes Towards Disability. Her interests include disability and bioethics and portrayals of disability in the arts. And Emmeline is here to speak today about the portrayal of the disabled soldier in Wilfred Owen's poem, Disabled, from 1917. So, Emmeline, over to you. Thank you. Um, oh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to, um, as Paul just said, I'm going to be sort of talking about um, Wilfred Owen's um, poem, Disabled, which was written in 1917. I don't, I don't know how many people are familiar with the poem, but I will be going through quite a lot of the, the text, so don't worry if you've never read it or anything. But um, anyway, I'm going to read out the, the presentation because I'm not very good at speaking on the path. So, um, here we go. Wilfred Owen's powerful anti-war poem, Disabled, written in 1917, was republished in the Guardian newspaper on November the 13th, 2008, as part of the newspaper's seven-day focus on aspects of the First World War. That day's topic was art in the war, and it's included discussions of how artists and writers had sought to turn their experiences of the First World War into art. Owen's poem was published by itself with no commentary and no explanation given for its presence, so the reader was left to make up his or her own mind. Um, yep, this is um, Side Wolf and Owen, um, who wrote the poem Disabled. Wilfred Edward Salter Owen was born in Oswald Street, Shropshire, on March the 18th, 1893. Oswald Street does also have a Welsh name, but I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it. Um, he was mainly brought up in Birkenhead in Shrewsbury. His parents' names were Tom and Susan, a Shaw, and he had a sister Mary and a brother Harold. When the First World War broke out, he was working as a tutor in France and enlisted in the 2nd Artists Rifles Officers, Officers Training Corps in October 1915. He wasn't sent to France until January 1917, when he joined up in the 2nd Manchester Rifles, who had emerged from the Battle of the Somme in 1916, with only 156 officers and men left alive. Later in 1917, he was observed to be suffering from shell shock, and arrived at Craig Lockhart War Hospital in Scotland on July 25th of the same year. Craig Lockhart and Disabled. It was here at Craig Lockhart that he met his fit fellow poet Siegfried Sassoon, who was also a patient. The writer Robert Graves, who had come to hospi the hospital to visit the soon, read Disabled and praised it highly. As an anti-war poem, Disabled is moving and powerful, but when that's looked at for its portrayal of disability, it is extremely problematic, evoking as it does familiar disabled tropes of asexuality, helplessness and hopelessness. The poem has an omniscient narrator, who tells the story of the central character, an unnamed ex-soldier who has returned from the Great War with severe and life-changing injuries. This is, this is the beginning of the poem, this is the first three lines. He sat in a wheelchair, waiting for dark, and shivered in his ghastly suit of grey, legless, sewn short at elbow. 
these few lines paint a melancholy picture. Both of the extent of the soldier's injuries, he appears to have lost three, or at least three, or possibly four limbs. And also of his isolation, to describe him as waiting for dark, Owen suggests he has nothing and no one to distract him from his thoughts or to help him fill time. As the poem continues, Owen builds upon the sense of loss and despair that he has created, leaving the reader in no doubt that, before the soldier received his injuries, his life had been one of full of excitement, promise and hope. This is another extract from the poem. About this time, town used to swing so gay, and glow lamps budded in the light blue trees, and girls glanced lovelier as the air grew dim in the old times, before he threw away his knees. Since being invalided out of the army and sent back to hospital in Britain, however, the soldier's prospects, particularly of being the object of a girl's romantic desires, have vanished. And this is another extract. Now he will never feel again how slim girls' waists are, or how warm their subtle hands. All of them touch him like some queer disease. These lines make it clear that Owen wants to show that enforced celibacy will now be the soldier's lot, and that if anyone does look at him, it will only be as an object of pity. This impression is reinforced in the final lines of the poem. Tonight, he noticed how the women's eyes pass from him to the strong men that were whole. How cold and late it is. Why don't they come and put him into bed? Why don't they come? Here, Owen portrays a soldier in such a way as to leave the reader in absolutely no doubt that now he is disabled, all the things that made his life fulfilling and enjoyable are irretrievably lost. There are two points to bear in mind here. Firstly, Owen himself has seen quite a great deal of frontline service, and furthermore, he wrote disabled whilst a patient at a military hospital. Consequently, he would have been well aware of the kinds of life-changing injuries that soldiers invalided out of the Great War could receive. Secondly, Owen was a highly political poet who was, or at least who became, a passionate critic of the Great War. In his other poetry, most notably in works like Dolce et Decorum Est, he raged against the lies that he insisted had induced young men in their millions to join the armed forces to fight and die for their country. This plays part in the poem Disabled. Um, this is another extract from the poem. It's, um, this extract it um, tells you about the soldiers' reasons for enlisting in the first place. It was after football, when he drunk a peg, he thought he'd better join, he wonders why. Someone had said he'd look a god in kilts, that's why, and maybe too to please his maid. The poem also gives a flavour of the glamour that the new recruit had believed that soldiering entailed. He thought of jewelled hilts, for dangers in paid socks, of smart salutes and care of arms and leave and pay arrears breed a call and hints for young recruits and soon he was drafted out with drums and cheers and this shows the uh, the illusions that the soldier had about um, and camaraderie and heroism which he thought warfare would entail and um, so it also shows that when leaving for the front he, he was treated like a, a hero by, by uh, other people by cheering crowds and so on contrast between the soldier's experiences being treated as a hero when going off to fight and virtually ignored when returning home seriously wounded could hardly be more marked. Some cheered him home, but not as crowds cheer gold. Only a solemn man who brought him fruits thanked him and then inquired about his soul. Um, that's... Um, Another extract from the poem which um, shows a marked contrast between the soldier's um, return to face other, his, his own isolation and other people's embarrassment about him. 
a recent television <coughs> program, Forgotten Heroes of World War One, highlighted the fact that disabled soldiers were prohibited from taking part in the victory parades which took place after the end of the conflict. In a similar way, this part of the poem seem, seems um, to indicate the, um, the, the myth, rather strongly, the mismatch between um, the heroism with which um, soldiers going out to fight were treated and the um, being virtually ignored after coming home wounded. Um, and Owen was um, killed a week before the armistice, so he, he didn't live to um, see any of the, um, the victory parades. But um, his um, words in the, these um, last two quotes, they, they do um, raise the question of whether or not um, he might have intended the um, poem to be a work of social realism. Um, and that this question is reinforced by the reference in the poems by the final stanza to the soldier's prospects. Now he will spend a few sick years in institutes and do what things the rules consider wise. And that um, portrays the, the soldier's prospects as being extremely bleak. So the question is, is disabled hope? Uh, a poem of social realism. No. Um, one of Owen's most famous pronouncements was, my subject is war and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. By this he meant that war was the ultimate evil subverting all the values that human beings were supposed to hold dear, values such as goodness, justice and compassion. In this way, the main soldier in Disabled is an emblematic figure, one who shows the terrible cost of war. This is perhaps underlined by the severity of his impairments. Of course, the First World War presented the societies to which wounded soldiers returned with an unprecedented number of impaired people, and the severity of the impairments incurred by soldiers is shown by, for example, the Queen's Hospital Sick Cup, which was founded in 1917, and where new, new techniques of facial reconstruction were pioneered. Nevertheless, seen in the context of Owen's attitude to war, and the probable political message of the poem, the soldiers' severe impairments seem to be largely designed to increase the reader's pity for him. But as disability studies academics and activists have shown, to afford disabled characters a purely emblematic status is both to shield oneself from the reality of continuing to live life and exist in the world with an impairment, and to adopt an overly fatalistic attitude to the difficulties, both physical and psychological, that someone with an impairment may experience. Throughout the poem, for example, Owen impresses upon the reader the soldier's isolation, he has no one with him, he has no prospects, he will never be a husband or father, the only basis he, he will attack will be ones of pity or embarrassment. In this way, the Owen leaves the image of the main soldier hanging, ex-soldier hanging as Ben Aspic. He's a monument to Owen's hatred of war, but he does not exist as a real human being. A final word. Criticise the idea of pity for Owen's disabled soldier is not to be ahistorical. In the aftermath of the First World War, disabled ex servicemen were vocal and persistent, though not always successful, in campaigning for their rights. During the Loot and Peace Riot of 1919, Discharged Soldiers and Sailors Federation, or DSSF, unveiled a banner reading, Don't pity us, give us work. Owen may have wanted his focus on the pity of war to affect social and political change, but these um, disabled ex-soldiers were highlighting the, the um, useless or detrimental nature of pity. That's it. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions?
questions or comments or thoughts for Emily and Andy? Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because Wilfred Owen, of course, didn't live to, no. to sort of show his show show what he would have done in practice, whether mm. or not he would have been in the middle of those yeah. Lucian riots or, mm. or not. And I think, and I think that's that's the difficulty. I mean, and in terms of his output, it was in in terms of, of, of his work, he, it was very sort of very early work, really, isn't it? Mm. That was then just cut short. Yeah. I mean, do you think he would have been another Sassoon later on if if those people were taking an interest in him? At that point, mm. do you think it, that's ha that's the same way because Sassoon himself got more and more anti-war as he went along, didn't mm. he? Yes, he did. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It, it's interesting because we we don't know how he would have turned out because he yeah. know, he never lived to yeah. turn out like anything. <laughs> yeah. But um, I, I certainly think it's possible. Yeah. I mean, he he wasn't comparatively speaking, he wasn't actually for the front at the front for that long, but. Um, Whilst he was there, he had an enormous number of quite traumatic experiences. So I, I, I think I would have thought it was highly likely that he would have, you know, become in a way another system. Mm. Mm. But we'll never know. <laughs> so. Any other questions or comments? And you, and you're reading around this. Did you? Did was his position? Did he ever see himself? Um, as disabled because he, that's why he was there from shell mm. shock. Or did did he was he standing back from that and just commenting on the soldier? What's what's your view of that? Um, I, I I don't think he did see himself as disabled. Mm. Um, but uh, no, I mean this this um this poem was sort of. It was written while he was in hospital, yeah. suffering from shell shock. But um, it's, it's a very sort of um, the narrator's kind of looking at the the, um, the d dis disabled soldier, which is a kind of distance. So um, I, I I do think it's unlikely that he saw himself as disabled. Yeah. I asked that because I wanted to link it in with some other images that we have of. of war, disabled war veterans, uh, particularly in moving image media. If you, you look at a film, like 1951 film, The Men, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, one of the first roles Marlon Brando played, and basically he spends a lot of time rejecting his wife. She wants to still love him. He says, no, I'm not a proper man, so mm. you can't love me. Uh, and. We, we see a, a similar thing in um, Born on the 4th of July with Ron Kovic, which is fairly accurately based on his, his biography. Uh, and Roddy's already talked about Ron, so I won't sort of situate him, but he, he again rejects his girlfriend in that, saying, well, you, I can't be done. And he ends up going down to Mexico and spending his uh, large amount of pension that he was getting, uh, or so the film made out, uh, on, on prostitutes. Um, and that goes back to sort of earlier statements from D. H. Lawrence, for instance, mm. in Lady Chatterley's Lover, where uh, Lord is not a lord; he's a sir. So Sir Clifford Chatterley is, is again rejecting his wife. Mm. Any advances she makes to him, mm. uh, and effectively pushing her into the arms of the, of the gamekeeper. Mm. And so the, there is a, a standard response. Uh, which I think is dealt with quite well in a book called Dismembering the Male, actually, mm. uh, of male sexuality, and that you can't have uh, sexuality as a, as a disabled male. Mm. Um, and some, that might explain some of the reasons why someone with a, men, a mental impairment mm. uh, would not identify as, with, with, as a disabled in this image mm. that, that, that he's got. But it, it, it sort of, in a way, tells us more about the attitudes of the time mm. than it does about anything else. Yeah. What do you and, think? And, and, and well, um, also um, with regards to that, I, I was sort of thinking that um, this idea about um, a disabled man can't have a sexual relationship, it, it, no one lives in a vacuum, and that, you know, to what extent are these ideas that um, people like Ron Covey or um, who have had themselves, or you know, what to what extent were the ideas current in their society? 
So I think it's probably quite sort of tricky to disentangle it. Yeah. Mm. Is it, are you aware of anyone who's done that? Because <laughs> um, it I, seems to me it's, there's we, quite a, a, a lot of material. Them, but I, I, you know, I've, I've sort of, I, I got it the other day, I've, I've read sort of three pages of it, so um, I can't speak for knowledge about it. Um, but, um, it tends to deal more with society's attitudes rather than the attitude of the person uh, and their own view of their sexuality. But then these things are circular in some ways, mm. and it's been quite a battle for disabled people to reclaim their own sexuality against the, the stereotype that, of course, you're an asexual person. So mm. it's, it's quite complex. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, I just find the whole issue around uh, critiquing poetry in the way you've done. Mm. And I wonder whether you've come to any thoughts around what we generally in the disability studies field refer to survivor poetry. Mm. And those people who have, have not acquired impermanence <coughs> in comparison to those who may, through, through say for example, acts of what, acquired impermanence. And we've always uh, had this tension where disabled people's rights in part, not wholly, but in part have been advanced because of people acquiring impairments through things like war, uh, and, and primarily non-disabled people's immersion into the world of disability and trying to make reflective thoughts, etc. Classically, like through, through the point you've illustrated. But again, um, and, and Roddy earlier on was saying about, uh, you know, the, the regeneration movement and, and you know Rempo and things like that and again just to add to the list apart from uh, disabled people uh, non-disabled people acquiring returning from war and conflict say as uh, war wounded and this aspiration to be physically fit either through sport and I would have added to the list also to prove that they were sterile mm. and that they could father fertile Sorry, sorry, fertile, thank you. Uh, they were fertile and they could father a number of children, say, for example. Yeah. And I just find it fascinating when you've got any thoughts about, uh, around uh, the survivor poetry uh, and the parallels between disabled people writing survivor poetry and those individuals, non-disabled people, acquiring impairment, writing poetry about disablement, in effect. I'm not sure really. I, I think I might hand over to Paula because you've written poetry. Yeah. So, do you have any thoughts? Mine's slightly different because I do have first experience of war. I was very much, um, I worked for the Ministry of Defence yeah. during the first Gulf War and I developed a mental health impairment because of my experiences of the first Gulf mm. War and what I was involved in at the time, which um, I'm still having um, treatment for today. And I don't think, I've been told by my doctors I may never get to grips with my experiences of what happened then. And to be honest with you, it's a very eclectic mix of poetry mine. Mine is survival poetry that friends I made that were armed in the armed forces, who I sent to war equipped, who didn't come back, who I actually saw die on a screen. I saw some horrific things. I was 19 years old. And, but then it was the experiences of what I went through in the mental health system, what I saw in hospital, what I experienced in hospital, what I experienced in the mental health system, what it what it actually did to me, because in a sense it radicalised me. Mm -hmm. You know, I had this thing when you, you work for a government department, you have to believe in what you're doing and you know you have to be apolitical, you couldn't have any thoughts. Even if you did, and I did, I was very passionate about veterans' rights because my grandfather served in the Second World War. My um, uncle was very much involved in um, around the Cold War and was um, a sub-lieutenant in uh, with, 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 within the nuclear subs in Polaris. And we have a very long history of serving in the armed forces. So I saw firsthand of what war did to my grandfather. He never believed in 
um, the British Legion and commemorating war. He said you don't glorify experiences and everything. And it, he couldn't identify to his family when he came home. He drank. He tried to drink away his war experiences. And I think it's very true for many who come home. You live with the war of the day. I live with my Gulf War experiences every day. Some things will happen to me and it takes me back to where I was over 20 years ago. You live with it and it's a very hard thing to, to come around. But as I become more radicalised with the protesting, because I started campaigning way before I developed a disability when I was a child. And but I didn't do anything about poetry until I had my war experiences because I couldn't. It was what happened to me in the war experience.